right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Amphitheater Hot Shop here at the Corning Museum of Glass. My name is Eric Goldschmidt, and I'm going to be sort of narrating our way through what is going to be an amazing afternoon of glass making. Uh, we are going to see some amazing furnace style glass blowing, some groundbreaking flame working style glass blowing, and uh, a piece that is going to come together as an amazing collaboration. So, first, uh, we'll get our, our featured artists introduced as they, they make their way to their benches. So we've got Yushin Goins off to my left side here. He is our expert flame worker uh, known throughout the world for particularly his very finely detailed pattern work and uh, really brilliant crisp forms. So Yushin is going to pull off a, a form that we're all quite excited to, to see here. Even has a, a very specially made torch for the occasion to, to go to the scale that he wants to go to. And to my right side is Austin Stern, a uh, glass blower who is now living and working in the Seattle area, very well known for using Venetian techniques and applying them to figurative work that is, that is really expressive and sort of touches on uh, themes of, of mental health and uh, a, a lot of themes of how we interact with each other and sort of personal emotion. So uh, to get things going here, we'll, we'll sort of lay out what's, what's about to happen. So Austin is about to get started essentially on a, a vessel form that will be a figure. So it'll be a hollow bubble form. So what he's got in his hand over here is a stainless steel, what we call a blowpipe. Uh, at the moment, it is just a steel tube, and he's warming up the tip of it so he can then come over to our gathering furnace here, our, our melting furnace, to gather some clear molten glass out of there. Uh, that is where we keep about 1,000 pounds of, of clear molten glass. It stays at about 2,100 Fahrenheit all the time. Uh, as he first comes out with the glass, it will not look clear. It will look orange because it is so hot it actually emits its own light. So he's going to get that pipe warmed up. If the metal isn't warm enough, the glass doesn't stick to it. Uh, but you might wonder, how does, how does the metal not get too hot at the other end for his hands to not wind up sticking to it or, or worse? Uh, thankfully, it's stainless steel. And stainless steel is a relatively poor conductor of heat for metal. So he'll, he'll hold up just fine there. If he does start to feel the pipe heat up a little bit, we've got ways to deal with that as well. So we can get that cooled off as necessary. So here we go. He'll start gathering some clear molten glass. Inside of the furnace, there's a big crucible, like a big bowl filled with molten glass. He dips the tip of the pipe in there, turns it, and it just sort of wraps the glass around the end, almost like taking honey out of a jar. So we've got our initial gather. It's going to shape this up a little bit, also cool it down a little bit. At 2,100 Fahrenheit, the glass in the furnace has a consistency that's very similar to honey, very fluid. And it's a good temperature to gather the glass, to be able to get it out of the furnace consistently. But it's a little too hot to actually start shaping it. So we use this metal table here. We call this a marver to shape the glass and also to cool it down a little bit. So he's just getting his initial shape set up before he starts inflating anything. And once he's got the, the shape and temperature right, here we go. A little puff of air in the end of the pipe. He caps the end of the pipe with his thumb to trap the air. And watch that glass. You see a little air bubble emerge in there. And uh, that is not much material for what he's really after. Uh, he wants to make a fairly large figurative form here. So he's going to cool that down a little bit, shape it a little bit. And it looks like we've got some color getting prepared to go on top of that. And I believe he said he has two colors that he wants to overlay on top of this clear bubble here. So he's going to keep this bubble relatively small. Michael Beam, who is going to be assisting here uh, off to my left side, he is preparing some colored glass. We get colored glass in different forms, dependent on the, the sort of visual texture that you want the piece to have. Uh, what Michael is heating up is what's known as color bar, which are thick rods of very densely colored glass. So he's heating that up. He's going to get it the, the right temperature and the right shape, so he then can bring it over to Austin to apply to his bubble here. And uh, what we call an overlay, so he'll actually drop the colored glass over the clear bubble, and Austin will then force that colored glass to completely cover the clear. 
that'll give us a nice uniform and dense layer of this white colored glass. And we've got Tom Ryder getting another what we call a, a punty iron set up here. These are solid rods as opposed to the hollow tube that Austin has. So getting these the right shape and right temperature. And once we've got that all set up, we'll start to lay that colored glass over the clear bubble. Once those overlays are done, then Austin can gather more clear glass over the top of that to build up more and more mass for a, a much larger object. And he also has some other pattern work that he's prepared. Uh, he has some other body parts that he's prepared. I know there's an arm that he made earlier today that's staying warm in the oven that Tom is looking into right now. So uh, we're going to have a, a lot of action going on here. Some pretty advanced furnace glass blowing, some pretty advanced flame working as well. So uh, we're going to have quite the, quite the experience over the next couple of hours here. So for those of you in-house, I want to make sure you realize we're also live on the internet right now. So we're live streaming this on the Corning Museum of Glass YouTube channel. And for those of you who are catching us online, we have a wonderful crowd in-house with, with us here as well. A, a nice loud crowd that is going to really appreciate this glass making here. There we go. A little inspiration for our glass workers. So, Austin getting started on the overlay. Michael got that glass the right shape and temperature so he could sort of drip it onto the clear glass. Austin has also made sure that clear glass is cool enough that the bubble doesn't collapse as he works the, the colored glass over the top of it. So managing temperature is absolutely crucial to what both of these guys are doing here. So Austin's gonna soften up the color a little bit more and then he'll force that color to, to completely cover the clear. Now, Yushin is getting going on some pattern work here, which is uh, part of his forte. Uh, he is known for very precise pattern work, typically with lines as the foundation of that pattern work. So what he's working with here is actually several stripes of different colors. He twists them in different ways to create some different types of patterning with those stripes. As he continues to dig in, we'll, we'll get some, some examples for you to see. Now, both of these styles of glassmaking harken back to other cultural traditions of glass blowing. Uh, I mentioned Austin's techniques are, are largely sort of grounded in Venetian technique. And Yushin, his pattern work is actually really thoroughly grounded in German pattern work for flame working from the, the mid 1900s or so. Uh, what the Germans would tend to refer to as montage, which is joining multiple pattern bubbles together to create a compositional hollow form with a very elaborate bit of patterning. So uh, we're sort of hearkening back to some older glassmaking traditions, but, but really putting a, a new spin on things here. So uh, another little bit of housekeeping here. If you do have any questions as we go along, uh, those of you online can submit your questions online, and our, our helpers, helpers here will get those questions to me so we can get those answered. Uh, those of you in our, our in-house audience, feel free to just throw your hand in the air, Shout out, hey, Eric, I've got a question. However you need to get my attention, and we'll, we'll get your questions answered as, as best we can. So Austin's just making sure the, the white glass is really well smoothed in. Everything's uniform. Also making sure there's no texture left behind. He's going to lay another color over the top of this. We don't want any texture on this initial layer of color, or it could trap air bubbles in between the layers. So everything's going to be nice and neat and smooth there. And Tom is preparing the next color to be laid on top of that one. And Yushin is working a, a couple of his pattern sections here. As we get a chance, I'll, I'll try to grab a little bit of his raw material. I know a lot of it is staying warm in the oven, but we'll see if we can get a, a piece to pull out of there. I know there are some interesting blue shades and some light purple tones and some white in uh, what Yushin is working with here. So Austin just getting the, 
the bubble the right temperature here, cooling it down with a little bit of compressed air, making sure it's nice and rigid to, to hold its form. And Austin and Tom are chatting, making sure they've got their timing set up as the, the temperature gets right. So Tom just keeps turning that iron, and as soon as Austin grabs the iron, he stops turning, and the glass just falls right off. Gives you an idea why we do need to keep the glass turning as we're working with it. Uh, gravity will take over, and it will just start to drip at a certain point. So the, the turning is a, a pretty crucial element of what we do making glass. So a little more about flame working here. So flame working really refers to using a focused flame to soften the glass to, to shape it. And the, the torch that Yushin is working with here is running on propane and oxygen. And as he turns those gases up as high as they can go, the flame temperature is going to get up a, a little bit over 4,000. This torch, I'm guessing, can get maybe up to about 44, 4,500. Um, we actually brought in a very special torch for Yushin just for this occasion. Uh, it is a, a torch that's made by a company called Glass Torch Technologies. And uh, we thank Willie and Wally very much for hooking up Yushin as we were sort of talking about what equipment he might need and, and what he was trying to accomplish here. We also, as part of our tool stash here at the museum, have a very large torch from Glass Torch Technologies that for me is way more than, than I ever really need to use. And I mentioned what we had available and Yushin said, oh, that's not big enough. So we better get in touch with these guys and, and get something a little larger. So uh, he's gonna make a, a very large patterned disc for this, this collaboration here. And I, I'm, I've seen a lot of flame working myself through the years. I'm very curious to see this all come together. It's, uh, it's going to be pretty groundbreaking. So he's just refining the, the tip of his pattern here. Ultimately, uh, he's got some pattern work that in order to best display it, he's going to want to rotate the axis of that form. And it will show us some, some more finely detailed pattern work that he's sort of been twisting on the ends of the bubble there. So I'll get that all neatened up. And Austin just making sure the colors really laid evenly over the bubble here. Very easy to uh, have different densities of color throughout the bubble if he's not cautious at this stage here. So moving material, we use sort of the friction against this metal table, against the marver to push material around as we need to. We use it to, to cool the glass, to shape the glass. And he's just making sure that air bubble is still in good shape within the glass. By adding the white over the top of the clear, the bubble's now opaque, so he can't see through. He's got to sort of work by feel. Every once in a while, he might blow in just to see how the glass is moving. That'll give him an idea how that air bubble's doing on the inside of everything there. So now he's just letting that bubble cool a little bit get rigid enough so he can come back to the melting furnace and gather some more material on top there. So this really unique opportunity here, this very unique collaboration, is something that is uh, put together by our shops of the Corning Museum of Glass. Uh, Yushin, in the past, has not sold any work through our shops here. And he, uh, he got pretty excited about the idea of, uh, of sharing some of his work here, making it available here. Austin has been selling his work through our museum shops for a few years now. And we're just very excited to, to highlight some of the great artists and artistry that, that goes into our shops here. We do have a reception afterwards for those of you who uh, registered beforehand to to join our reception. We have a selection of pieces from both artists available there. Uh, the pieces will also be available after the event. Now, Yushin is particularly well known in uh, the, the facet of flame working where folks specialize in making pipes for cannabis consumption. And that actually is a really fast-moving facet of the glass world right now. It may even be the, the fastest sort of developing aspect of, uh, of the glass world these days. And that has become a, a fairly new 
thing for the museum. We, we have a few pieces in our collections now that are, that are modern uh, pipes. And we're also selling a, a few pipes in our museum shops these days. It's a, a very viable market in glass, and some of the greatest advancements that are happening in glass these days are, are really evolving through that scene. So we find it very important to represent that uh, properly here at the museum. So Yushin has actually been teaching a class the, the past week and a half. That class continues through Friday of this week. Uh, this is maybe his fifth time teaching a class with us over the last several years. So we're always thankful uh, that he comes out and shares his expertise. I know I see several of his students up in the, the audience here. I'm sure they're as curious as I am to see where, uh, where all this is headed. So Yush has been uh, one of the, the leaders in that field really for uh, probably almost 20 years now. And uh, again, particularly well known for very precise pattern work and really crisp technical forms in his work. So uh, for sale here, we do have one of his pipe pieces. I know there's a couple of marbles that he's got for sale and also some pendants. And we have a number of Austin sculptural pieces and some wall pieces that are available in, in our shops as well. So a great opportunity to see how this work gets made and, uh, and also have it available for purchase. And for those of you who are curious online, uh, the work is also available for our, through our website. The one piece that is not available through the website is the pipe from Yushin. That one you're going to have to come in and, uh, and see it in person. So Austin continuing to get the bubble shaped out now that he's got a fresh gather of clear glass. You can see how the scale starts to grow quite a bit. Now he does have some pattern work prepared in what we call a pickup box. That's the oven that Katie just opened over here. So he wants to make sure the bubble he's preparing is gonna fit into another bubble that he already prepared that, that has some pretty intricate pattern work that is in that oven. So the, the move to pick that up is to sort of drip this bubble in there, blow into it so that fresh hot glass fills what he's got prepared in the oven and then he'll lift the whole thing out and start to shape that as one object. So the, the piece he's working on, it's probably about a five hour piece, but thankfully he's done a fair bit of prep work. So we, we should get the rest of the process done in these two hours here. Yushin also has put in several hours of, of prep work to, to get his piece uh, to a, a good point where we can get this all, all worked out in a couple of hours. Folks love asking us here at the museum how long it takes to make a thing on the torch or a thing at the, the furnace. Really depends on what the thing is. Detail takes time. The scale doesn't always take that much time, but uh, fine pattern detail like what Yushin is up to, that takes a long time. Uh, the sort of pattern detail that Austin has prepared, also the sculptural detail that uh, he's gonna be making and also that he's already prepared, that takes time. So uh, this, this whole object with all the hours put into it is probably gonna be uh, maybe about a 15 hour object all, all told. So that's, uh, that's enough time to make a pretty advanced piece of glass. So I mentioned if the pipe gets a little warm, we have ways of, of cooling it down. Austin's using our pipe cooler. This is like a, a little water fountain, essentially. It's got a, a foot pump in the back where you can fill this little trough with water and just use the water to cool down the pipe. As you look closely at the pipe, you can see the whole nice stainless section that looks like stainless, nice and shiny on, on one side. And then you see just beyond Austin's hand, it gets really tarnished. Well, just beyond his hand is where it starts to really heat up, and hence the, the tarnishing. And we affectionately refer to that part of the pipe as the hospital zone. You don't want to put your hand there. That's where it gets really, really hot. So you'll, you'll notice his hand stays in pretty much the same spot throughout. It's not going to creep any closer. Uh, people are always curious with, with flame workers as well. 
we hold the same pieces of glass that were melting as the glass is creeping up around 3,000 Fahrenheit. Thankfully, glass is actually a really poor conductor of temperature as well. So holding onto these glass handles, he's doing just fine. Now, as he starts to work the object and it gets larger and larger, then it radiates a lot of heat, the, the object itself. So he's going to need a little more distance. Now, Yushin has a, a whole bunch of materials already prepared that are in this oven to his left side. You might notice there's a really long tube with a couple of pieces of tape hanging off of it there. That is a, a massive bubble that he has already done a whole bunch of color and pattern prep to. And uh, that gives you an idea how long a handle he's going to need to stay a safe distance away from the object as he really starts to, to heat it up and shape it. Now, what that big bubble is still missing is the last little bit of pattern work that will be the, the focal part of the center of it. I believe that's what he's working on here. Is that right, Yush? This is going to be that end cap there? OK. Yeah. So the, the part that's facing me on this is what will be the pattern that will face the viewer of, of the finished object. The opening he's got there, he will use to attach onto the larger bubble that he's already prepared. So as he gets this section ready, I suspect he's probably going to pull that big piece out and, and start to manipulate that a little bit. So that'll, that'll give us an idea what sort of big secret is hiding behind the door there. It's, it's pretty impressive. All right. So Austin's got a couple fresh gathers of clear on top of that. He's going to shape this up, make sure to get it just the right shape and size to fit into the, the prepared bubble that he needs to pick up out of the, the pickup box. I should also introduce Katie Hubbs over here, who's going to be assisting Austin quite a bit. They're actually old college buddies. You guys blew glass together at school, right, at Emporia State? Nice. There we go. <laughs> Emporia State represent. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so there, there are different paths that uh, glass workers learn this, this craft on. Uh, the more common path nowadays is the path that, that Katie and Austin have gone down, where they learn to work glass in a, a collegiate program. So there are probably, oh, we'll, we'll pick up the bubble here. Oh, no, just doing a, a little size check. All right. So uh, nowadays, most folks are learning to work glass in collegiate environments. There are maybe a, a few dozen schools across the US that have glass as part of their, their Bachelor of Fine Arts programs, or also uh, offerings of, of master's programs as well. Uh, there are universities across Europe and, and Asia as well that have glass making as part of their art programs. So that has really become the, the most common route for, for younger folks to start to learn this craft. Uh, another great place to, to learn this sort of thing is here at the museum. Across the parking lot here, we have a world-renowned teaching facility. We bring artists in from uh, across this country and also around the world to teach here. Uh, there are also a number of other public access facilities uh, across the country as well. So uh, what used to be a very difficult craft to, to find instruction in has become a, a much easier thing to, to find. So the, the glass world has really opened up its, its information over the last uh, 20 to 30 years or so. And, uh, and nowadays, there's all sorts of great information out there. All right, so just waiting for this to get cool enough. And are we? Taking another dip on there, is that? Oh, boy. Gotcha. Gotcha. All righty. So we're, we're bringing the pickup box, the oven that this extra section is in, up a little higher in temperature. Uh, we don't want to leave it at too high a temperature for too long, or things can start slumping. But we do want the, this piece up around 1,000 Fahrenheit, maybe a little bit above that before he brings it out of that oven. With the glass that Austin is working with, if it starts to cool below 1,000 degrees as he's still trying to work it, it is very likely to start cracking. So that 1,000 degree temperature range is a really important range. 
So we want to get uh, anything he's going to bring out of the oven above that temperature. And he's going to have to move pretty quickly from that oven to the reheating furnace he's using over here, which you'll often hear referred to as a glory hole. That oven just provides heat. Uh, the oven back here behind Michael I mentioned earlier is a melting furnace, so that holds clear molten glass in a, a big tub. So the ovens are shaped a little, di a little bit differently. They're intended to be used a bit differently. So just waiting on temperatures. And Austin told me he's going to take what's known as a strip gather on top of this bubble here. He's going to gather some material, and he'll drip all the excess right off of it into this bucket that's uh, next to the furnace here. As you go into gather, it's hard to control exactly how much material you come out with. Uh, the size of the bubble and the temperature of the bubble will dictate a lot of that. But uh, it's hard to come out with just a little thin, thin uh, layer of material. So he's going to come out with more material than he needs. He'll drip off the excess. And then he'll quickly go over to the pickup box and use that fresh molten glass to pick up the, the other cup that's inside there. So just waiting for this to cool enough to gather on. Yes, sir? How do you know when this glass is at or above 1,000 degrees experience? What we look at the most is the glow of the glass. That glow is going to be a little different depending on what colors you might be using. Uh, but you really, your eyes tune in very closely to how that glass glows. And also, as you gain experience making similar pieces, you start to understand what your, your time window is as well. So we watch the glow of the glass. As he's really doing the shaping, he's also watching the movement of the glass to judge temperature. So here we go. We'll get that right in there, get another nice gather. And as he comes out, he's going to let a lot of that glass flow right off. It'll give you a good idea just how fluid this glass is at 2100 in the furnace. Yeah, so I'll just let that drip right off of there, whatever he doesn't need. And he just sort of uses the, the heat of the molten glass to let it sort of separate itself from the rest of that mass. So we'll cool that pipe down a little bit. Hey, Tim, you mind coming down here? So what Yushin has here gives you an idea of some of the, the prepared work that he's, that he's working from. He's got some very fine stripes on a piece of tubing. Oh, tube cane. That's what he likes to call it. And simply by manipulating those stripes in different ways, he's able to, to create all sorts of different pattern work. And that actually starts as a much bigger tube with a whole bunch of individual rods of colored glass, rods similar to uh, something like this. So we fill one tube with the rods. We insert a slightly narrower diameter tube in there to hold all, the, all those rods in place heat that mass of glass and stretch it to, to get to the point where Yushin is at right now. So that gives us very thin, finely detailed stripes on a hollow bubble. All right, so Austin getting it all prepped, getting ready for his pickup out of the oven. Getting the shaping and temperature just right here. What is this pattern work going to go for, Yush? Uh, this is going to be the very end of the pattern on the disc. Uh -huh. like the very middle. Gotcha. Okay, so 
He's uh, working on the very center point of uh, the, the big disk that he'll be creating. So, some really fine, you're gonna do like a switchback sort of pattern? Yep, okay. We'll get into a little more of the detail of the patterns as they start to come together. Tricky to describe, so I'm not gonna bother uh, waving my hands to describe them. We'll, we'll let you actually see what they look like. All right. So Austin's ready to go ahead and pick up that pattern cup. Looks like our oven's out to, up to about 1,050 Fahrenheit. He's got the glass on the pipe arranged just right. All the thicknesses are where they need to be. The temperature's just right. So he's going to climb up on these steps here and let the tip of that bubble start to fall right inside of the cup that you'll see in a moment. Very important that it hits center. The whole bubble sets right into the cup. You can see that on our camera view. Scoop that on out of there. Nicely done. Looks like we got it all in there nice and clean. Do we like that? That's a very important step to keep it all nice and clean. Worthy of a fist pump. <laughs> so now he wants to continue to shape that, get it all nice and uniform again. Michael just cleaning up the, the Marva here, making sure there's no dust or dirt on there. We don't need to pick up any extraneous foreign materials on the glass. And I didn't get to see the, the patterned cup yet, so I'm curious to see uh, what exactly we have. I'll give you some descriptions. So just getting the rest of that cup really cleanly sealed down around the bubble. <laughs> it's a lot of glass, huh? <laughs> yeah, for us flame workers, we start to feel our tendons twinge a little bit when we see that much glass. <laughs> your, your tendons are also twinging, yes. Wow. All right. Austin suggesting this is somewhere between about 40 to 50 pounds of glass. Oh, off the end of the pipe is, okay. Yeah. So probably, probably about 10 pounds of glass, but when it's that far away from your body, it takes about the, the leverage you would need to, to carry 40 to 50 pounds. So yet another one of the, the tough things about blowing glass, especially on this scale. Uh, it's a lot of weight. It's a lot of dexterity required. Uh, he does not want to come out of the furnace and just drop that thing on the table and, and ruin the whole shape. So he's got to have a, a good sort of supple grip on things to immediately be able to roll it across the marver here. Really keep that shape in order. So despite the fact it's so heavy, he's got to, got to finesse it. So he's getting the, the very end of the cup sealed down to what we call the collar or the, the moil. So that, that glass that's right on the end of the metal pipe still. It's important to have a, a good bit of glass on the pipe itself because it gives you stability to control the rest of the glass that's hanging off the end of the pipe. Checking patterns. And what is the, what's the middle color? Uh, purple. Okay. Like an amethyst? Yeah. Or, okay. All right, so for the color work on Austin's bubble here, we've got that white layer and he put a transparent purple, like an amethyst purple over the white. So the white's gonna give some opaque background to that. The, the purple will really pop over the top of the white. 
And I still didn't get a close look at the cane work here. Uh-huh, okay. Do we have some pieces of cane around here, Michael? Oh, actually. Yeah, so I was talking about the, the different forms that colored glass can come in and, and some of the different sort of patterns we create. I mentioned color bar, so the, the solid rods of color that uh, Austin put as those first two layers of color on the piece. So we have some, some bigger chunks here. So it comes in these big chunky rods if we need uh, a, a thick chunk. This is going to give us a really flat, uniform coating of color by using a color bar. Or uh, we've got crushed up colored glass that we call frit that comes in different sizes, anything from uh, almost like driveway gravel to a really fine powder that's almost like uh, confectioner sugar. So the different physical textures of those colored glasses will give you some different visual textures as well. Uh, what Austin has in some of his pattern work here are what we call canes. So we can take the color bar, we can layer multiple colors over one another, heat that up and stretch it and make a really long rod and then cut the rods into some smaller sections and we can create pattern work that way. That is really sort of uh, part of Austin's forte. That does stem from uh, Venetian style glass blowing, Venetian techniques, that sort of what we call cane work. And so he has taken some canes, twisted them, created this twisted pattern, and sort of folded the cane onto itself to create a, a more elaborate, a really fine bit of line work within that pattern. You can sort of see on the, the monitors the, the fine line work that's going on there. So Yushin, we can see his work a little better on the monitors there now doing what we call a switchback pattern. So he took a pattern that initially had straight lines running horizontally. He heats an area, twists one direction, moves the flame a little further, heats that area, twists the opposite direction. So now you've got these lines that are sort of zigzagging back and forth. He will then take what is sort of a long cylinder of that pattern, work it back into a round bubble. And that will really tighten up that, that switch back pattern work. All right, so now we've got all our necessary shaping tools to get everything nice and round. And Austin and crew have the bubble set up nicely. They've inflated it quite a bit. And it looks like maybe we found a, a little bit of uh, what we might technically call schmutz on the very end here. I think it may have picked up a, a little bit of dust or some of the kiln brick from inside of the oven there. We don't want that in the finished piece, so he's using a little uh, rotary tool here <coughs> to grind out that uh, unwanted little bit of material there. So getting that all cleaned up. Good eye to spot that before this goes any further. This is one of the last opportunities to remove any, any unnecessary material like that. All right, so now Yushin's done all those switchbacks, sort of twisting back and forth throughout that pattern and he's starting to work that long cylinder into a ball now. And as he sort of com condenses that uh, cylinder into a ball, it's gonna really tighten up 
the patterning of those switchback lines. So continue to work that together. You guys are pretty good with your elaborate patterns, the, these two artists. Should be some pretty good stuff coming together here. I know Yushin has <coughs> also already prepared a, a really beautiful marble with multiple layers of, of pattern work within it. So Austin will be making a figure that is going to have the, the hands coming together that's going to hold that marble as well. Now, I should also point out, these guys are using very different glass compositions. Uh, I know a lot of folks don't realize it, but there are many different recipes for glass out there in the world. There are actually tens of thousands of, of different recipes for glass out there. As you change ingredients in a glass recipe, you can wind up with some very different characteristics to the glass. So these guys are inflating and making the, the bubble larger here. Austin's controlling the, the shaping with what is actually a pad of folded up wet newspaper. It's about as close as we can get to really shaping the glass with a bare hand. So really trying to control that form as it continues to inflate. So glass compositions. The, the glass that Austin is working with is the most common glass on the planet, what we call soda lime glass. The main ingredients in that glass are very pure silica content sand, and that sort of sand is mined from sandstone mines. Uh, there is some soda ash or sodium carbonate. That is also mined from the ground. It comes from de decayed plant life. And uh, some limestone, which is also mined from the ground. You put those three ingredients together in the right proportions, heat them up to about 2400 Fahrenheit, you'll get a really nice, clear, what we call soda lime glass. Now, the glass Yushin is working with is what's known as borosilicate. And uh, again, the, the main ingredient in that glass, as in with just about all glasses, is very pure silica content sand. There is some soda ash, there is some limestone. There also is some boron oxide. The boron oxide, really changes the characteristics of this glass. Glass, as it's heated, swells or expands a little bit. As it cools, it contracts. The different compositions of glass expand and contract at different rates. The, the glass that Austin's working with, it expands and contracts a lot with, with temperature change. So it's a lot less tolerant to temperature change. If it's heated or cooled too unevenly, different areas expand and contract so differently, they pull apart and they crack. We call that thermal shock. Borosilicate glass does not expand and contract nearly as much as soda lime. So it tolerates temperature change a lot better. Borosilicate is very stiff glass. If we were trying to work that glass out of this furnace and work it at a bench the, the way Austin's working here, the borosilicate stiffens up too quickly to get any shaping done by the time you sit down at the bench. So not an ideal glass to, to work in a, a furnace format, but when you're working over a torch, you're working in the heat source pretty much the whole time. So borosilicate glass is, is perfectly, perfectly uh, workable on a torch. So some different glasses, gonna give you some, some different results. Borosilicate is very difficult to work on this scale and a, particularly this volume, this sort of thickness and, and density. So at this point, Austin's squeezing in a constriction between the pipe and what will be the, the finished sculpture. We call that sort of a constriction a jack line or a neck line. Ultimately, he's going to need to remove the glass from the steel pipe we need to tell the glass where we want it to break so it comes off at that correct spot. So that jack line that he just put in there is his way of telling the glass, hey, this is where I need you to break. So that'll be very important when we go to, to remove the bubble from the pipe. So elongating the form here, getting it a little more cylindrical.
So another big difference between flame working and furnace working, you see Austin's team cranking away over here. Yeah, he's got a, a team of three very skilled assistants working with him. And you see Yushin's team working away over here. Flame working, we, we do a, a fair bit of teamwork and collaboration, but the vast majority of flame working can be done solo. So a pretty, pretty handy thing and a, a very accessible process. Uh, I'm not sure what a torch like this goes for, but you can get some smaller, smaller torches, less complicated torches for a few hundred dollars. Uh, or you could spend thousands of dollars to, to get a much more advanced torch. Uh, you do need a, an annealing oven as well. You could spend as little as maybe $1,000 on an annealing oven. And, and really, for within maybe $5,000 or so, you could have a pretty good flame working setup ready to go and, uh, and be able to work glass by yourself, and, and off you go. Uh, the, the furnace studio is a bit more elaborate, as you can see. We've got a big melting furnace, a reheating furnace, uh, benches, teams, so uh, a, a process that allows you to, to make much more physically substantial work, but it also uh, requires a, a, a lot more expense, too. So some interesting contrasts in, in, in what we all uh, have going on here. So Austin is directing Tom as to where exactly he wants the most heat applied so he can get this shaped out just the way he has envisioned. Yushin has that, that what was a cylinder that he did all those switchbacks, all those manipulations to, now worked into more of a ball, getting his pattern centered just right. So using another one of our most important tools in a glass shop, gravity, letting this elongate. So as Tom was directed where to apply the most heat, so as he hangs the piece down, it stretches the most in that area where it's hottest. And as Austin saw that it had gotten long enough, he sort of directs the pipe to level horizontally, so it's no longer uh, just stretching with gravity. Getting a nice, neat cylinder formed here. Also making sure to keep track of his thicknesses as well. He doesn't want any areas to get too thin on this. Uh, he's going to be attaching other parts to it. We want to make sure it's thick enough that uh, making those connections, uh, they can be nice and robust. So just getting that all shaped up here. So torches are, are important for more than just flame working. You see Katie has a, a torch over here. This is just running on natural gas. And she's heating the glass that I called the moil earlier, that glass that's on the pipe itself that helps to support the rest of the material that's hanging off of it. We, we want to make sure that doesn't get too cold as he goes along as well. Here we get our first look at Yushin's big bubble that we're keeping warm in the oven here. Trying to figure out proportions of all the rest of these parts here. Uh, 
Here, I got you. I got you, Austin. Yeah, yeah. There you go. I don't know the rules. Yeah. Know. You're okay. Um, there we go. Is yeah. <laughs> that how it was? Yeah. That is how it was. That's a really big bubble for flame working. For those of you who don't see much flame working. <laughs> So figuring out proportions of exactly how much bigger Austin wants to go with the figure to, to get the proportion to, to work with the big disc that Yushin is working on. Collaboration can be tricky. It's become a, a more and more popular thing in the glass worlds, uh, the flame working world especially. We see collaboration all the time nowadays. And uh, it's a really interesting opportunity for artists to sort of help each other grow a bit. Uh, when you're collaborating with someone else, you really have to consider what's most important in your work that you want featured in, in whatever you're working on. Uh, you also have to develop that balance of respecting the, the other person's work so it's highlighted properly as well. And uh, when you've got different processes, very different styles of objects coming together, trying to get the scale worked out is, is not the easiest thing either. I know these guys have worked, uh, worked out a drawing together, but I, I don't know they've defined exact proportions until now as they're, they're seeing the proportions happen. So <laughs> it's a fluid situation. <laughs> All right, so Yushin's building up his pattern here. So he's created these very uh, thoroughly patterned balls. Now he's going to connect two of those balls together and create a larger, more detailed ball. That ball eventually will go on to that very big bubble that Austin had pulled out uh, a few minutes ago as well. So giving you an idea how this piece sort of grows in pattern complexity and also in, uh, in form complexity. He right, wants to get those openings just the same diameter so they go together nice and cleanly. And this is, this is part of what Yushin is really well known for is this really precise, very clean, very technical pattern work. And uh, he is respected around the world for his control of, of this level of stuff. Nice, yeah. And together nice and clean. Yeah, that's for you. <laughs> Uh, both of these guys have well-established repu uh, reputations for the quality of the work they do, the quality of their pattern work and their design, quality of finished objects. You guys are awfully quiet with questions out there, both in our in-house audience and, uh, and online. So the end of the form that Austin's working on here, this is going to be the bottom. So he's establishing the, the right diameter, now starting to flatten the bottom. So he's got a wooden paddle working on the, the very end. And he also had the, the steel tool in his hand. We call those a pair of jacks, sort of controlling the, the profile on the, the side of the form there. And it's almost sort of setting up a mold between those two tools there to really squeeze the glass into just the shape that he wants.
So as far as tools go in, in glass working, we'll use anything that just doesn't burn too quickly. So as you can see there, he's got a, a wooden board. A lot of the, the wooden tools we use, we do keep waterlogged so they don't burn very quickly. The paddle he was using there is a dry piece of wood though. When the glass is over a certain temperature, over maybe 1500 Fahrenheit or so, we're comfortable using a wet tool with it. But as it gets any cooler than that, we don't want to use a wet tool because that moisture could be enough to cool the glass below 1000 degrees too quickly thermal shock kicks in, we crack the piece. So we do consider those, those concepts uh, when choosing which piece of wood we want to use. And as far as tools over on Yushin's bench here, he has a lot of graphite over here. Uh, he's got these circular graphite pieces like what he just picked up. We most commonly use those for marbles. To, we call it a marble mold, to make a marble nice and round. And to do that, we don't just stick the glass in a round mold and squeeze it. We have to take the glass and turn it within that round mold. Uh, if you don't turn evenly, you don't wind up with a sphere. So you do have to be very accurate in using the tool. It is an aid. It doesn't guarantee everything is perfect. You, you have to manipulate the glass accurately with the tool. So he wants to get this all nice and round and uniform. So it'll be nice and clean to add on to the bigger bubble. Now Austin is punching a hole in the bottom of the form here. He has a, a little tungsten rod. He's heating the tungsten with that torch and the hot tungsten is able to sort of pierce right through the, the body of the, the glass vessel. So now there's a hole down there. Ultimately, as they remove the piece from the current blowpipe, they will have to catch it on something. So Katie has been preparing another hollow blowpipe with some glass on the end of that. They're gonna stick it onto the bottom here. If they didn't create this hole on the bottom, when they seal off the top, the whole thing would be sealed. And as you heat a sealed form, if the air inside of the form is a little cooler than what's around it, you create a vacuum and the tube sucks itself in. If the air on the inside of the tube is hotter than what's around it, it puffs out and you start inflating the form when you don't intend to. So that little hole that they pop there is gonna allow that air pressure to, to relieve itself basically, go back and forth. So once he's got the form sealed, he can still continue to manipulate the, the bubble. So just getting getting the glass set up just right on the end of that pipe to uh, attach on the, the bubble here. So if you've seen other glass demonstrations throughout the day or in the past, whenever you may have seen them, you'll hear us say the word punty, P-U-N-T-Y. The, the punty is a secondary handle we use to attach to a piece of glass so we can continue to work the other end of it. So the, the punty that is being created here is specific to an object like this. So they've made, I th think it was a crown punty initially and now it looks like a ring punty. So there is glass on the end of the, the hollow steel tube some of that glass comes right off over the end of it. It sort of projects beyond the end. So that ring of glass will stick around the hole and he'll still be able to inflate the glass if he needs to by blowing through here. So just setting this up just right so it covers the hole properly. It's gonna be a wide enough attachment point that it will have a, a good stable grip on the piece and he'll be able to torque on it effectively. Going to gather a little more fresh glass on top of that. Make sure it's just the right size and just the right temperature.
So we want to make sure the end of that pipe is open where the glass is. As he gathered over it, the glass does cover over the end. So he just blew a little air bubble in there, stuck it right into the reheating furnace. That air bubble just popped open the, the little layer of glass that was on the end of the pipe. So now he'll have a, an open pathway for air to get through there. Some pretty sharp pattern work. The uh, the cylinder that Yushin had done the switchbacks and sort of twisted opposite directions. When it was still a cylinder, those lines were sort of curved back and forth. As he squeezes that pattern back in to create a ball, creates this really sharp, almost like a saw saw blade sort of look to things. So we've got a really sharp, precise switchback pattern here. You can almost see it from the camera there. Yep. Starting to see a little more of the, the true color of Austin's, Austin's piece there. When glass is really hot, it's hard to see the, the true color. We don't really see the, the true finished version of most glass colors until they're back closer to room temperature. But uh, as, as the piece stays out of the reheating furnace for a little longer time, you can start to see that nice amethyst over the, the white, giving a nice, beautiful purple in there. Yushin trying to get that opening just the right size. So getting ready for the transfer. This is one of the more exciting parts of the process here. So we want to attach the pipe that Katie has in her hands to the bottom here, make sh making sure to leave that hole open. And we want to remove the piece from the pipe that Tom is turning over here. Now, ultimately, we do need to separate Katie's pipe from the piece when everything's all, all shaped and finished. So Austin's squeezing in a little constriction there. That's going to help for uh, when we do go to break the piece off of this punty here. Getting that centered. So Katie's just sort of feeling out how rigid that connection is. And as she feels comfortable with uh, the stability of that connection of the punty, Austin's going to chill that neckline, that constriction that he put in there. So Michael's been heating all around that constriction, but then we want to chill it severely so it will break. So a couple drops of water on there. That thermally shocks the glass, gets it to start cracking a little bit, and then a vibration will be enough to get this off of here. So a little tap, and it vibrates, and off we go. Very nicely done. There we go. Nicely done, Katie.
We've never used this torch in this space before. I just had to turn up the oxygen pressure quite a bit so we could maximize the, the flame that this thing will put out. Alrighty, I got your door there. Oh. Alrighty, so we've got the big bubble here. Has a little bit of kiln dust from some of the soft bricks inside there. We just want to wipe that dust off of there before he starts to really heat this. All right, so he's already got a few sections that have all been interconnected. As you saw him attaching a couple of the bubbles together for the final section of pattern, this already has, looks like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, maybe nine sections already stacked together there. So now he wants to open up the tip of the bubble that's where that next pattern section will go. So that will be the very center, the, the real sort of focal feature of this big bubble. This big bubble is then gonna sort of set atop the head of the figure that Austin is working on. So we'll have one of Yushin's marbles in one of the hands and we'll have this big bubble here that will, uh, it'll sort of He'll, he'll have a post attached to the bottom of the disc. That post will slide into a hole that Austin's gonna create in the top of the head of his figure. So these glasses, they can't actually be fused hot, or well, they can be fused hot, but as they cool, they will crack apart because as I mentioned before, they expand and contract at different rates. So the only way to assemble these different glasses is to do it in a, in a fashion where they're assembled cold. So I know this is pretty experimental territory for Yushin as well. These are, these are patterns and forms that he's very comfortable with, but just pushing the boundaries of scale quite a bit here. You want a tink jar? Yeah, I need one. Okay. Yep. You bet. So as Yushin is peeling material off there, he wants to dispose of that, that hot waste glass quickly. So I just brought him a little cup with water. And uh, that way, if he needs it, he can just sort of dip the end of the rod in there. It'll crack, and he can sort of tap it off the end. What we affectionately refer to as a tink jar, because it tink comes right off of there. So the, the torch that Yushin's working with here has three stages to it. So this is one stage. That would be the second stage. He just kicked on with uh, one of the foot pedals there. And then we have yet another foot pedal. He'll kick that on. So the, the first stage is really just sort of that central flame. And then as he kicks on the second stage, it's another ring of openings for the gases that comes on. And then the third stage is yet another ring of, ring of openings for the gases. So it allows him to control the, the size of the flame. And he can adjust temperature by adjusting the flow of, of oxygen and gas on any of those stages. So Austin is putting a, a chalk line on the pipe itself. That's gonna help him and the team know which, which way is up. And, and where the front of the piece will be. And 
Yushin's trying to get that opening just the right diameter and nice and clean. So as he goes to attach that last section of patterning, everything's going to be nice and clean and concentric there. And that uh, really is a, a big part of what his reputation is built on, is really these beautiful, crisp, clean, elaborate patterns. So Austin has sort of tapered down the opening on the end of this piece, but he's left it open still. That allows him an opportunity to reach inside and do some sculpting from the inside of the bubble if he chooses to. And I noticed one of the tools he just put up on his bench is what we refer to as an inside sculpting tool. So that gave me a little, little hint that he might be headed that direction. So the torch he's using now is running on uh, propane and oxygen, that allows him some more extreme heat to really soften up specific areas of the bubble. Whereas the, the bigger, fluffier torch that Katie had been using a little earlier uh, is not quite so hot. And it doesn't really get the glass soft, but it keeps it warm. So it keeps it above that thousand degree range, but doesn't really get things moving. So Austin's sort of setting up the heat with the torch in one specific area. Tom's going to take a reheat over the entire piece. When he brings it back to the bench, it should be hot enough in the right spots that Austin then can start to manipulate it a little bit. Yep. So he's got this uh, piece of steel with a big steel ball on the end there. That'll allow him to move material from the inside of the form here. And Michael's protecting Austin with those paddles there. That glass radiates a lot of heat. So Austin does have a, a glove on, but that's not enough when you're that close to that big of a piece. And it is a, a fairly thick Kevlar glove, but uh, it really helps to have the added protection of those paddles. So Yushin going for the stick here, getting that bubble attached, removing that extra handle. Got it on there nice and clean. So now he wants to get that incorporated into the rest of that big form there. He's going to do that with heat, centripetal force, and surface tension. So as he continues to, to heat that bubble, the glass itself wants to sort of pull together. There's surface tension amongst the atoms where they want to pull closer and closer together. So he'll have that force of the glass sort of pulling itself together. And also as he continues to turn faster and faster, centripetal force is going to pull that form in and then wider sort of laterally. He'll also use gravity a little bit as well, I think. Probably tilt that up so the glass falls back onto itself as well. Can I get you a blow? <laughs> yep, absolutely. <laughs> I'm here, I got plenty of wind. Good to go. <laughs> so here I am talking about how flame working is typically done solo and yeah, right off the bat here. When you push the envelope, sometimes some other other tools and assistance need to come into play. So <laughs> whatever is necessary. And Austin continuing to 
manipulate from the inside of the bubble. Looks like he's creating the beginnings of uh, maybe an arm here. <laughs> I gotcha. I'm here. I'm full of hot air, you might as well use it for something. So I talked about how with soda lime glass, what Austin's working with here, we do not want to let any area of that piece come below 1,000 Fahrenheit. Mm -hmm. So as Tom is taking reheats, he's got a couple of jobs going on here. Not only is he trying to heat specific areas that Austin wants softened. He's also giving what we call flashes, which is feeding the entire piece inside of the oven so the whole thing stays up above that 1,000 degree range. And at this point, Tom really is just maintaining that overall heat. And when Austin needs heat in very specific spots, needs very specific areas softened, he's going to do that with the torch. <laughs> right. We need to, get, need to get some shots of that. So you might be able to see the, the pattern section that you just added is continuing to sort of work its way into the rest of the form here. Yeah, this, this is uh, pushing the boundaries of scale here, for sure. There's that third stage. <laughs> what do you think, Willie? Looking good? All right. <laughs> Our torch builder is in uh, the third row in the blue shirt over here. <laughs> Willie and his brother Wally, Glass Torch Technologies, they're uh, just over the border in Pennsylvania, build some of the best torches for flame working that, that have ever been built. And uh, when Yushin mentioned the, the sort of heat that he needed to, to pull off this piece, there was no question as to where we were going go to go to find the right torch. Yeah, I was thinking that too. <laughs> this is pretty serious. <laughs> Yush says he's having fun over here. This is the fun part. Looks pretty fun. And hot. All right, so. Looks like Austin has accomplished the sculpting he needed to do inside of the bubble. He's just now sealed it off. Yeah, yeah. There we go. Yeah, watching live glass making, uh, one of my favorite descriptions of, of how to approach it is think of it like a jazz show. There's a lot of improvisation going on as you see something that grabs your attention and you, you feel is worth uh, a little applause there. Please, by all means, jump in. Crazy, 
I don't usually do this while I'm narrating, but I think this sort of requires it. <laughs> uh, this is not something you see really ever. Make sure we got that. Do you want that yoke moved at all? Maybe not. Yeah, so you can see just rotation, heat, gravity, a little bit of air pressure, and that pattern just sort of pulls itself right together. Yeah, so one, one drastic difference you see in the, the glasses themselves through the way they're manipulated. Yushin hasn't heated the, the backside of that piece at all, or, or the, the tube itself hasn't had to heat any of that. He doesn't really have to worry about that stuff. As, as long as uh, what he's trying to manipulate gets hit by the flame, he's good. When, it, when we first started talking about what these guys were shooting for, Yushin said, oh, you know, about a 10-inch diameter disc, which I took to mean he would blow out maybe a, a six-inch diameter ball and flare that open like a plate, and that would be the disc. But no, what he's going for is a disc that is a full hollow disc, which requires a lot more material than just flaring open a, a quick plate. So using a graphite paddle here to help work out the shape a bit as well. Graphite is a, a really handy material when you work with molten glass. It accepts the heat really well. And no matter how hot the graphite gets, it'll never stick to the molten glass. Most other materials, as they heat up, they do tend to stick to molten glass. Just trying to get the, the mount of the torch tightened up a little bit more so it holds its position.
So discussing some uh, last design decisions here. This is just such a, <clears throat> a different scale from what we're used to. We have to think about some larger scale tools to try to manipulate this with. So uh, Austin is going to grab one of the furnace blocks, these big wooden scoop tools that we use to really shape and center and cool furnace glass more, more typically. We're, we're going to do that with this big bubble of boro here. <laughs> See? Some real cross-pollination here. So Yushin's just trying to get the, the temperature just right here. And I'll try to just turn the glass very cleanly inside of that block to really start tightening up the shape. And it looks to be working pretty well, too. <laughs> nice. Yeah. <clears throat> Developing techniques on the fly here. Not bad. The definition of collaboration there. <laughs> uh, so you can see that really cleaned up the, the form a bit more on this end here. So in the meantime, Tom is sort of camping out on, the, on Austin's piece here, making sure it's staying properly up to temperature. This is the glass blowing version of a holding pattern. It gives you an idea of the, the change of scale of, of what Yushin is working towards here. The, the biggest marble mold he has, which is pretty toasty, is this guy here. Like, not nearly enough for what we're working on now. So yeah, it's a good thing we have those blocks around. All right, so Yushin is really setting up a lot of heat now to try to finish the form. He, with really just rotation and, uh, and surface tension, as he continues to turn faster, now that he's got most of that bubble really, really hot and moving, it's just going to continue to sort of pull itself into a, a narrower and narrower disc. And you can really see the, that switchback pattern, that sort of sawtooth look on the front of the bubble. Let's see it's becoming more and more of a tighter disc. So he's got to heat just the right parts of that bubble to get it into the, the form he's after. So most of the heat towards the front of it, a lot of heat really on that, that sort of outer edge so the glass continues to stretch in that area. And really controlling the form by controlling where it's hottest. This, this sort of form and pattern work is uh, really sort of signature of, of Yushin's work. That's the biggest pendant I've ever seen. Nice. It's, a, it's like a pendant for Flavor Flav there. Nice. All right, so Austin is starting to build more of the parts onto his figure here. So he just pulled out 
Looks like an arm with a, a hand that's ready to do some gripping there. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> so this is the hand that is going to hold the, the marble that Yushin brought with him. So we've got Yushin's teaching assistant, Tim, over here helping out, better known as Ease Glass in the flame working community. He's helping him to judge the, the shape on the front of the form since Yush can't see it. <laughs> So the furnace team getting the heat set up here. Just sort of making sure everything's the right temperature in the right spots, identifying exactly where that arm and that hand are going to go, adding a little extra heat on that part of the vessel form here. So Tom will take one more overall flash on the piece, and then we'll get that arm attached. We've seen a lot of glass making in this amphitheater, which we, we just opened back in 2015, and some real uh, sort of boundary pushing glass making. But <clears throat> I don't, I don't know that anything tops what these guys are up to right now. Wow, <laughs> that is pretty amazing. All right, so Austin's going to get this arm attached here. He's got a pair of diamond shears in his hand, so he's able to chill the glass on the punty, and he'll be able to remove that, uh, the metal handle, the punty, and just leave that arm and hand behind. There we go. Yeah. So now the, the reheats start to get more and more complex for Tom as we get more appendages added on. You have a question up there? How much does it weigh? That's probably about 10 pounds of glass, but it's also at the end of a four-foot tube. So there's a lot more weight away from you, and it's effectively like trying to manipulate about 50 pounds when it's that distance from your body. Yeah. So luckily, we've got the, the right team for the job here. So Austin, just trying to get that hand just in the right position. One of the, <clears throat> one of the tricky things about sculpting with glass is we have to manipulate it at a horizontal, but the object is going to stand at a vertical. So he's got to be able to sort of figure out the, uh, you know, where things need to be when that piece gets moved 90 degrees to the, the vertical there. It's going to make sure that hand is in the right position that when it goes, you know, back to, to vertical, it's going to properly hold the, the marble that's going to go in there. So since these guys are working very different compositions of glass, as I mentioned before, they can't hot attach them together. So they figured out ways to rest the marble in the hand, or in the case of the disc, there will be a, a tube that comes off of that, and there will be a hole in the top of the head of the figure that that tube will slide through. So they've, they've engineered some, some good solutions to be able to combine their work here. But uh, if Austin doesn't get that hand position just right, once it's cool, there's no more manipulating that. So he wants to get that right right about now. All right.
Some pretty serious glass making there. <laughs> uh, Yushin has been making forms and patterns like that for quite some time. I know the, the first time I ran into him was a competition out in Las Vegas back in 2009 where he was already really sort of dialing in the, those sorts of forms and patterns and they've only gotten cleaner and, and more elaborate uh, since that time. So Austin has the marble that ultimately is going to go in the hand. Uh, he can't attach it, as I mentioned, but he can at least use it for scale to, to get the fingers in the right positions here. Hey, Austin. Can I see that? Maybe we'll show it to the camera. Awesome. Thank you. So we'll try to give you guys a view of the pattern work inside of the marble here. Now there's some pretty amazing pattern work in here. So yeah, there we go. Alrighty, excellent, thank you. So we'll pass this back to these guys so they get it to fit properly. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, this is a wonderful collaboration. We're really getting the, the, the best out of both of these guys here. All right, so we need to punch a hole in the top of the head now. So this hole, there will be a post attached to the big disc that Yushin just finished there, and uh, the post will slide through the hole. These guys are talking design over here. Austin is really happy with the proportions of the disc to the, the scale of his figure here. So again, using tungsten and the drill to punch a hole through the top of this here. This is a great way to make a very accurate hole in a, in a piece of glass when it's hot. There are ways to do it when it's cold. You can drill a piece of glass with a, a water-fed water drill press and a, a diamond core bit. It's another way to go about creating holes in glass. But to uh, continue to manipulate the size for these guys, it's easier just to do it hot. So Yushin has a graphite tool in his hand that will uh, open this up to a very precise diameter, and then he'll have a post that will match that diameter as well. So Austin's sort of guiding Yushin through the amount of thickness that is uh, left at the top of the form here. So just about there, getting the, the diameter right. And these guys are talking about the next steps here. Austin is going to draw a face on the, the head of his figure here, have it sort of glancing down at the marble. A 
fun to see these guys really sharing their processes with each other. Very true collaboration going on here. Those might be slightly different diameters there. All right, so we've got another piece of the same diameter tubing. The, the glass that Yushin is working with, borosilicate, it really was developed to be used for making scientific laboratory equipment. or the, It was first invented for lenses, actually, back in the, the 1890s. And uh, so as it developed to become a material for scientific equipment, manufacturers started to put it out in very specific diameters and wall thicknesses. So you can get exactly the, the size and thickness you need to start a, a piece of apparatus. It's also very handy to have these, uh, these standardized sizes for what these guys are up to so they know this tube measured out to fit into that opening is going to be the same as, as what's going to be attached onto the disc. So everything will fit. So Austin's noticing the, the fingers are moving a little bit with each reheat here. So he's trying to keep them in check, but ultimately he'll probably have to do one last real check at the, the very end here, make sure those fingers are in just the right position. And Michael with the torch on the, the bottom of the piece here, just making sure that's staying above 1,000 degrees. Uh, a lot of the focus is on the top of the piece, it's very easy to forget about what's going on at the bottom, but if the bottom gets too cold, the whole thing starts cracking and we're done for. So good assisting there, always looking out for the, the gaps and attention. So it looks like Yushin is preparing the tube that will be the post that gets attached to the disc. And Austin's ready to start drawing the face onto the figure here. So he has a, a very thin cane of some sort of aqua blue. Adding little dots for eyes. Get those sort of heated and pressed in there. So now as Austin is really focusing in on the, getting the, the details of the face done, it's even more important for Tom to really stay focused on the, the bigger object there, making sure the temperatures are staying just right. Another crucial element of a, a good assistant is really just keeping an eye on the overall situation so the, the lead artist, or what we refer to as the gaffer, can really focus in on the details as they need to. So drawing the mouth on here. Was there a practice run before this? No. No, no practice run for this specific piece. But uh, about 20 years or so of practice for both of these guys in general. <laughs>
Yeah, so they had a concept beforehand, did a, a lot of chatter back and forth before coming to town here. And uh, then today, some, some other design discussions about proportions and, and uh, a little bit about color palette, I know, as well. And uh, yeah, now they're sort of diving in headlong here and, and getting it done. So there, there will be little design adjustments that are made. Yes, I think I do. So Yushin's getting his workstation all set up for this last attachment and detach that he's going to need to do here. Let me know if you need another set of hands there, too. Hey, Rob, did you come here for a sec? So just figuring out the, the last few moves. So just sort of figuring out these last few really critical moves here to get that post on here properly. All right. All right. Well, Austin is liking where the, the figure is at now. Thinking we're pretty much done with the figure. <laughs> so the next move with the figure is going to be removing it from the punty and uh, getting it into an annealing oven. So it will cool down slowly and evenly through the night. Make sure it cools and is nice and stable in the morning. Definitely an Instagrammable moment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so applying a little more heat to the bottom of the piece here. We want to get it moving on the punty a little bit just to make sure it's... Uh, going to come off of the punty correctly. So we warm up that whole bottom area and the glass on the punty. Then they'll cool a very specific area where they really want it to break off. 
And that is a, a good way to really control how that comes off of the punty. Now, as it comes off of there, it is going to leave some of that extra punty glass on the bottom. That will be mechanically ground off when the piece is cool, once it comes out of the oven. So I should, should also point out, this piece, once finished and cooled properly, will be available through our shops here at the museum. So be sure, uh, if you're in town, to, to take a look in probably a day or two, and it will be available. It also, uh, I'm sure we'll have it online at shops.cmog.org, shops.cmog.org. So I mentioned how glass expands with heat and contracts with cooling. Because it does move like that with temperature change, it's crucial the glass is cooled slowly and evenly at the end of the process. We call that annealing. So every atom cools and contracts at the same rate from the top of the piece to the bottom, from the surface all the way into the core. So if, if Yushin's disc were a more typical size, maybe two inch diameter, what he would typically do to finish that off is he would attach a solid rod to the face of the pattern very delicately and attach a, a hollow tube on the perpendicular axis. And that tube is gonna be the, the finished, finished bit that will feed into the piece. But because this disc is so large, he doesn't want to do that extra attachment to the face of the pattern. It's just not stable enough. It could end up tearing part of the pattern off. We certainly don't want that. So he's going to go about this a little differently. We're going to get a tube attached where it needs to be attached for the post. And uh, he will remove that, the blow tube that we were blowing through earlier. And then he'll probably finish the back of the piece when it's cold. I, I talked about how we'll mechanically grind off any excess glass from the punty on Austin's section here. We'll do the same thing. We'll mechanically grind off what needs to be removed from the back of the disc for Yushin's end of things as well. Sounds like a smart decision. That's uh, going to take a, a lot of the risk out of the piece here. And I just heard Austin say that was our last flash, which means it is time to remove the piece from the punty. So Michael's all suited up in some Kevlar gear here. And Austin will add a little bit of water where we want this to come apart. That starts to crack the glass a little bit, a little bit of thermal shock on there. And Michael will grab that with the gloves, get a good grip on it, give a little tap on the pipe comes right off there. We're going to run it over to an annealing oven so it'll cool slowly and evenly through the night. It's going to set on a little pad of fiber frac, some soft insulative material. There we go. Nicely done, Austin and team. <laughs> Very nice. So we got one last attachment to go here. Attachment and detachment. All right. So Yushin created a hole on the perpendicular plane of the disc here. So now we can attach a tube on there that will be that post. And this is an, an attachment he does on much smaller discs pretty regularly. Everything is exponentially more difficult on, on this sort of scale change. So just wants to really make sure that whole disc is nice and warm over the entire piece. And then he'll really focus heat just on that opening to make this attachment. 
as he makes the attachment, it needs to be nice and clean. We want the, the wall thicknesses to be nice and uniform between those two sections. Uh, if they're not uniform, it makes for a weakness. Hey, Tim. So here we go. We want to get this attached. <laughs> yeah, I guess you could. Yep. Let me know what you need. Ah. Tom, you want to get, get a hand over the end of that tube when Yush tells you to? And I can puff for you. Yeah, I don't know if I'll, I'll let you know. I'm going to try and do yep. it with just one touch. So getting the temperatures set up just right, getting these aligned just right with borosilicate. Getting those temperatures really precise for attachments is crucial. All right. So <laughs> you're tilted. Yeah. There you go. So as you heat the ends of those openings, they get a little thicker. So as he makes the attachment, right where that seam is, is a little bit thicker than the other bits of wall thickness there. So heating and then puffing a little bit to make that seal more uniform. Whoop. <laughs> for, for those of you on the internet wondering what double blown and triple blown are, here you go. <laughs> so he's sort of working his way around that seal. Thank you. So he heats the seal a little bit in one area. We want to puff it out a little bit to keep the, the wall thickness uniform. And yeah, when you start really extending the scale and complexity of, of your work, you have to start inventing some, some ways to get it done. So. All right, so we've got a pretty good seal on there. Now we want to remove the other blow tube. So he's got to sort of heat from both sides to get this off of here. And this side, as he melts this off, isn't going to look perfectly pretty. But again, tomorrow, once it's cooled properly, we'll mechanically grind off whatever other material needs to come off. Oh, oh, maybe not. He is going to melt it in. <laughs> All right, so we'll keep that warm. Yeah, that's, that's worthy of some applause there. <laughs> We're gaining on it. So we want to let that soak in a little bit of heat. We'll give it a couple of minutes to, to warm back in there bring it back out, and it sounds like he wants to melt off some of the, the last little little bits that are still left there. Mm -hmm. Okay, and he's gonna bring the, the pattern all the way together to a, a nice center point as well. So we're gonna let that oven come up for a moment or two here. And we're creeping a little bit past our, our closing time here. But we're, we're almost there. And uh, as we do finish up, we're going to ask everybody exit upstairs. 
those of you who have registered for our reception to, to meet the artists afterwards, you can loop back down to our retail space from up above. And uh, we've got a, a whole display of these guys' work set up out in the, uh, the lobby. And uh, we'll have a, a wonderful meet and greet with these guys. Now, one other thing about glass is you can't rush it. You have to operate at the speed the material requires. We don't want to take any extra moves where that disc might have gotten a little too cold in one spot and then all of a sudden hit it with the flame. So we use the oven to, to balance temperature, to ease heat back in there. The oven has been holding at about 1,060 Fahrenheit throughout, throughout the, the demo here. That's a temperature where we can take the glass right out of there, put it directly in the 4,000 degree flame without any issues, no thermal shock, nothing cracking. But at 1,060, the glass doesn't soften. So nothing's gonna change shape while it's in there. We use an oven like that for really two purposes. Uh, we'll use it as a garage where we're keeping pieces warm, pull them out, continue to work on them, put them back in there or we'll use it to anneal glass. And annealing is that slow, even cooling, making sure all the stress is, is taken out of the glass so it's more stable once it's, once it's cool. Uh, if we don't anneal things, they do start breaking eventually. Uh, some things will break within a, a few minutes of coming below 1,000 Fahrenheit. With borosilicate glass, if it's really evenly worked, it may not crack for days or weeks or years, but eventually that stress is gonna find its way out and, and it will break. So annealing is an absolutely crucial step in, uh, in really any glass production. Anytime you melt glass, it needs to be annealed to, uh, to be a final stable piece. So I'm watching the, the temperature sort of creep up as we open the door. The oven dipped down to maybe 1,000 Fahrenheit. I can see it creeping up. We're just about at 1040. So we'll let it creep up a little bit further. And again, this is not the sort of thing we want to rush. There are many hours and, and quite a bit of uh, sweat and whatnot <laughs> going on in there. Every day is about three 10-hour days of work on the disc. There's about three 10-hour days of work on the disc. So yeah, we're not going to rush anything. <laughs> Rough estimate. I'm going to guess that's about right. That doesn't surprise me. That's, that's a lot of work. It's a lot of preparation of color. It's a lot of manipulation of pattern and then attaching the, the different bubbles and the shaping. And then, of course, these last couple hours here of, of really sort of finalizing it. So it's coming together. This is one of the harder parts of, uh, of flame working is waiting for that piece to come up to temperature. You guys are having a, the, the real thorough flame workers experience here, this anticipation and the, the anxiety, but you gotta stay patient. <laughs> All right, we'll give it just a few more minutes in there. <laughs> yes, Sheen's pointing out how painfully slow time goes by in these moments. But you, you have to sort of accept them and, and let that be part of the process. When, when he works on most of his work, he's got many different detailed components that come together into compositional pieces. So he usually has several sections that he's working on all at once. He might uh, attach a few pattern elements, set those aside, and uh, connect a, a few more pattern elements. And then he's got these two separate objects that, again, are going to get attached to each other to become this larger object. So usually, as he's working his way through a piece, He's going to have dozens of hours in it, but that, that can all sort of happen at once. He can be working on one section, that stays in the oven for a bit as he works on the next section, and, and he has a lot to sort of go back and forth with. But uh, at the moment, we are just focused on that disc, so uh, that is the one part that needs to happen. <laughs> all right. Yeah, so... 
Yush is pointing out for annealing, it's uh, one minute per millimeter of thickness. I, I would say that's more for reheating and feeling the, the pieces stable. Uh, annealing more maybe five minutes per millimeter of thickness. But yeah, as far as feeling safe about pulling that piece out, uh, a minute per millimeter is probably pretty smart. That makes sense. Yeah, so we had determined annealing times based on the composition of the glass, what ingredients are in it, and also how thick it is at its thickest point. We want to make sure it cools perfectly evenly from surface into core. Alrighty. So, getting an overall heat on the whole thing getting areas to really soak in some heat. 1,050 is good if you're taking the piece right out and going right into the flame with it. But he's going to work just the center of this piece. So he wants to get even more heat in those other areas. So they're going to hold temperature as he does focus just on the, the center of the pattern here. So really soaking heat throughout. And then he wants to remove that last little bit of clear glass and also bring the color pattern right to a point, right to the, the center of the spiral there. So we've got to remove the glass very neatly. Really want to make sure that pattern stays centered and nice and crisp. We know he didn't spend the other 30 hours developing this disc to lose the pattern right at the very end here. So he's got everything set up just right. We'll make sure that stays nice and clean the rest of the way here. So just picking off the clear glass first. Then I'll keep peeling and pulling that color out to the point. And he's got a very specific technique for making sure the, the very center of the pattern is, is proper color density and it's nice and crisp and clean. It's very easy to sort of pull the center of that pattern, pull so much of the color off of it that when the pattern's finished and the, the shaping's done, it's transparent, you can end up seeing through there. So he's trying to peel off this last little bit of material, really keep that pattern nice and crisp right to the center there. And yes, I'm gonna sneak another picture in because this is some pretty rare stuff going on here. It's the biggest lollipop ever. All right, so getting the tip of the pattern set just right, and then he's going to manipulate the form and get that what has come to a little bit of a sort of a cone shape on the tip to settle back into the rest of that flat disc form. So in order for the pattern to stay centered within that form, he's got to get the heat nice and even all around that area. So he's got to really sort of work to get that heat nice and even around there so that glass will settle back cleanly and, and uniform. At least you can see it when you blow in now. This is making my arms pretty tired just watching. I imagine Yush must be pretty exhausted by now. A 
It's not often in flame working that you have to run around your torch and your workstation to, to get the piece made. finding myself speechless, which is pretty rare. This is just some, uh, some amazing glass work in here. This is not something you ever see. Not anywhere, let alone for a, a public demonstration. So pretty incredible. I mentioned early on in the, the demo that this, this sort of pattern work and this sort of construction of pattern work really stems from German glassmakers in the mid-1900s and a, a process they called montage. And uh, I've seen quite a bit of that work. None of it gets near this sort of scale here, not on this sort of a form. So really sort of taking, uh, taking older techniques to uh, 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 just a higher level here. So just trying to continue to get that heat all around that area so it just continues to sort of settle into a more uniform overall form here. And again, this is something he does on two inch discs all the time, but uh, we're, we're well beyond two inches at this point. I know Yushin has uh, quite the, the collector base internationally for his work. And uh, I know his collectors love the, the collaborative work as well. This is quite the unique collab for, for anybody in the world. This should be a, a highly desired piece, I would imagine. Getting there, continuing to sort of work the heat further and further out in the disc to get more of that material to pull together and flatten out. So as he heats and things are settling in, if it settles a little too much, a little puff of air, push it back out. So really just controlling that form, little bits of air pressure, a lot of surface tension of the glass pulling itself together. But that surface tension doesn't work unless he gets the heat in all the right spots. So when you've done a, a form like this, as many times as Yushin has, you, you know the different states of formation that it goes through. So it started as a cylinder, manipulated the pattern, worked that into a ball, attached one ball to another ball to another ball, continued to blow that up into a larger, wider ball, works that into a disc. And then to finish the disc, he's used to seeing that sort of cone shape that he initially pulled the clear glass off of. And he knows that that cone evolves into sort of this rounded form that protrudes from the disc. And he knows that getting the heat in the right spots around that protruded form is going to get it to settle back into that final disc shape and keep the pattern right where it's supposed to be. 
you don't start at this scale. You start much smaller, get that down, and then maybe after a couple of decades of, of really controlling that form and the patterns within that form, then maybe you start to experiment with, uh, with larger scale. Good thing you brought that torch, Willie. <laughs> We'd be in trouble without that thing. I'm glad you put that paint job on it, otherwise we'd never know there was a torch over there. <laughs> yes. Who made the torch? Willie over there. GTT, Glass Torch Technologies. Ah. <laughs> Yeah, Willie and his brother Wally build some of the best torches in the game, if not the best. So, did he pick the colors also? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So, if you're getting a little itchy to get to the reception, the reception is open. So, to get there, you can go up the steps, you'll take a right as you get to the top of the steps and sort of loop back down the escalators. So just throwing that out there in case anybody wants to make their way there. Looks like we've got a few more minutes to go on, uh, on getting the disc worked out the rest of the way. So in addition to meeting Yushin in Austin and, and seeing a, a beautiful array of their work, uh, a, a very well-known artist who is local to our area, Kat Burns, has some work set up there as well, and she'll be here for the, the meet and greet as well. Uh, if you don't know Kat Burns as one of our wonderful local glassblowing uh, community here, you may know her from the uh, Netflix series Blown Away, where uh, she has done quite well in the, the competitions there. She was in season two? Is that right? Season two and also the, the Christmas the, the Christmas special as well. Kat is a wonderful human, fantastic glass maker, and we love having her here in our, our glass community in Corning. Alrighty, so we are at that point. We are very happy with the form. Beautiful work, we'll get Austin back out here. We'll get that piece into the annealer. How about a wonderful round of applause? Austin Stern and Yushin Goins, everybody. <laughs> Fabulous work. Excellent job, guys. So thanks to all of you for sticking around here in our in-person audience. Thanks to all of you at home on the internet. And uh, we look forward to having you join us again for our next live stream. And uh, those of you headed for the reception, we'll see, the, see you there in just a moment. Uh, again, we're going to have everybody exit upstairs. And uh, you can loop around to your right as you get upstairs there. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>